Hello and welcome back to my channel. For today's mountain video, we are going to finally be talking about Nirmal Purja, also known as Nims Dai, and his project Possible, where he climbed all 14 of the 8,000 meter mountains in just six months and six days. The previous record for this feat was nearly eight years, so this was truly superhuman, and I was following the entire climb from like April to October on social media. It was all I could think about or talk about, so getting to rehash this is gonna be very interesting. If you followed my TikTok when I first posted about this, you'll know some of the basics of the story, but today we're gonna get into each of the climbs, the rescues, and then we're gonna talk about why this was so controversial in the climbing world. As a small note, the reason I'll be referring to him as Nims and not Nirmal is because he took the name on after this project. His teammates actually gave him the name Nims Dice, spelled as one word but he spells it as two when he signs off on things and um, from what I could find out Dai means older brother and that was why they gave him that name. Nims Dai is a 37 year old Nepalese mountaineer who was born in Magdi, Nepal. Shockingly he only started climbing in 2012 when he was 29. Previous to climbing he had served with the British Armed Forces as a Gurkha and in 2009 was the first Gurkha to pass the selection process for the Special Boat Service which is an elite special forces unit of the Royal Navy. Now before we get into Project Possible let's talk about Nims's climbing history history because it is incredibly unique and really short. In 2012, he summited Le Bush East, which stands at 6,119 meters tall, and that was his first major ascent. I know to non-climbers or enthusiasts, that's not really going to sound like a whole lot, but for comparison, the tallest mountain in the United States is Denali that stands at 6,190 meters. It's a big mountain. One article for Red Bull states that he hadn't even wore a pair of crampons before the age of 29 when he summited the bush east. I'll insert a little picture of crampons right here. We'll I'll do a video on gear later. Y'all have asked for that. But what you need to know is the, the, these help you cling to the mountain. You need them and you need experience with them. So I can't even put into words for y'all how unreal it is that this was his first ascent and summit, but from there he was hooked. He started saving up every bit that he could and spending any free time that he had in the mountains. In 2014, he summited his first 8,000er, Dalagiri. Now, if you've watched any of my previous videos, you know how seriously acclimatization is stressed on these climbs so that you don't die, you know? Yeah, no, Nims didn't do that. He didn't acclimatize. Nims climbed Dalagiri in 14 days flat and led 70% of the route, meaning that he was fixing lines and ensuring that others could reach the summit. Other Nepali climbers and Gurkhas still have to acclimatize, even if it's to a lesser degree. So this can't just be a, like attributed to him living in the area and being born there. This is a truly unique physiological trait. In 2017, the Gurkhas went on an expedition to Chomalungma, paid for by the British taxpayers. I'm not gonna go into detail about how I feel about that right now, save that for another time. But anyway, he led the fixing team and ensured that 13 of the members of the expedition reached the summit. They were the first team to summit from the southern side that year thanks to Nims's leadership, which has become a theme of his career. I've also read that in 2017, he did a five-day tour of Chomalungma, Makalu, and Lhotse, which he had to return straight to work after. I haven't been able to find the timelines for these or if they were at the, a part of the same trip, if they overlapped or what, because climbing windows are usually really small. But both of these climbs are clearly referenced and apparently took place in 2017. Anyway, after this tour of all three peaks, in Nims' own words, I was supposed to get a heli ride to a special forces mission, but the heli didn't come because of the weather, so I ran all the way from base camp. Six days worth of trekking in 18 hours running through the night. At that point, I realized, I think I've got something. And he was right about that. One of his jobs as a part of the SBS was as a mountain trooper, and in 2018, thanks to his growing mountaineering accomplishments, he was appointed head of extreme cold weather warfare. His job was to learn new climbing techniques and then teach them to others. He asked his command for 80 days off to climb the world's five highest mountains, and they declined his request because it was too much of a risk on his life. So he quit his job and started Project Possible instead. The goal of Project Possible, also called the 14-7 Project, was for Nims to climb all 14 of the 8,000 meter mountains in just seven months. There were so many reasons that Nims was fired up about this project, and he went to grueling lengths and made incredible sacrifices to make it happen. While he had many ambitions, such as raising money and awareness for climate change and promoting tourism to Nepal, his biggest driving factor was to bring Nepalese climbers into the light. He was quoted as saying, for the last 100 years we've been in the background, but high altitude mountaineering, 8,000ers, that is our ground. I felt I needed to do something about this. 
that's what gives me energy. On April 23rd, 2019, Project Possible celebrated their first victory as NIMS and the team successfully summited Annapurna in Nepal, considered the world's deadliest mountain with a 33% fatality rate. After returning to base camp, NIMS learned that Chin Ki Kin of Singapore had been separated from his climbing team at 7,500 meters and had been left without food, water, or supplemental oxygen for approximately 40 hours. Now, if you missed my previous video on high mountain rescue and why that's so incredibly difficult and dangerous, I'm going to link that in the cards above so that you can go take a look at that if you'd like to have some more background information on High Mountain Rescue itself. Nims and three members of his team, Mingma David Sherpa, Gesman Tamang, and Gelgen Sherpa, launched a rescue mission. This was a rare case where the team was able to be dropped by helicopter at Camp 3 via a long line and then climb up higher. What was supposed to be a 16-hour climb to reach Chin took them only four hours, and they were able to bring him back down. He was evacuated to Kathmandu and then eventually Singapore, where he sadly passed away in the hospital. But the bravery and selflessness shown by Nims's team and the effort in their rescue was incredible. On May May 12th, Nims and the team summited Dalagiri, the seventh highest mountain in the world, and just four days later, on May 16th, they summited Kanchenjunga, the third highest mountain in the world. And it was here that the team would participate in a further four rescue missions. As they were descending Kanchenjunga, Nims and his team came across Biplab Baija and his guide, who had run out of oxygen and were stranded at 8,450 meters, well into the death zone. Soon after, they found another climber from the same party, Kuntal Kanrar, who was suffering from high-altitude pulmonary edema. Nims and his team sacrificed their own oxygen in the death zone to try to save these climbers and began radioing for help while trying to move them lower toward Camp 4. After a few hours, Gesman started showing signs of frostbite and high-altitude cerebral edema, and Mingma began to also show signs of haste, and both had to continue descending for their own safety. By this time, sadly, Kuntal had already passed. Nims continued trying to rescue Biblab, but after 10 hours, he realized that no further support was coming. And realizing the reports later, it looks like he was still at they're trying even after others realized that there was no hope left. He had been told that oxygen was on its way up from Camp 3, but nobody ever came. He was waiting in vain while other teams were waiting for him to return. Oxygen ran out, and despite Nims' best efforts, Biplab sadly also passed away. Incredibly, even after all of this time, as Nims was still attempting to finally descend out of the death zone himself, he learned about a fourth climber, Ramesh Roy, who was also suffering from haste and wandering aimlessly on the mountain. Nims, along with a Sherpa I have not been able to find the name of, found and rescued Ramesh, and he and another climber who was stricken with frostbite were both later evacuated from the mountain. In all my searching, I haven't been able to find a definitive answer on what happened to Biplab's guide, but it seems like he made it off the mountain because the people who are listed as having perished on the mountain that season are all accounted for. These rescue attempts made world headlines, shortly followed by this photo of Chomalungma that you've probably seen by now. It might be the most famous modern climbing photo taken. This clearly shows the dangers of the traffic jams that have been happening near the summit of Chomalungma. Malungma for the last several years, and this photo going viral is truly what launched Nims's name into the spotlight. Between these two incidents, people started paying attention to his project, donating to his GoFundMe, and sponsorships started coming in. I remember distinctly that this is also the time that he actually started putting out his Project Possible merch, and I bought this shirt, a hat, and a car decal sticker, and I wore my hat to work every single freaking day. I tried to find it for this video, but I couldn't. Um, but I, yeah, I... <laughs> I was obsessed. I just wanted to do my part to help fund this mission. I really believed in it. As you may be able to guess from the context of this photo, Chomalungma was his next climb after Kanchenjunga, and he was determined to beat his previous speed record of climbing Chomalungma, Lhotse, and Makalu in five days. I don't think you'll be surprised to find out that he beat his record. On May 23rd, just one month after the first summit of this entire project, Nim summited both Chomalungma and Lhotse in the same day. Two days later, on May 25th, he also summited Makalu, officially breaking his previous record by two whole days. In the first 31 days of the project, Nims and his team had successfully summited six of the 14 peaks. This part of the project was called Phase 1, and after this, everybody went home to rest for a bit, continue fundraising, and prepare for Phase 2. After just a few weeks, on July 3rd, they began Phase 2 with the ascent of Diamir, more commonly known as Nanga Parbat, and a affectionately nicknamed the Killer Mountain. The weather for this climb was particularly brutal, and after the summit on July 6th, the company Bremont officially sponsored Project Possible, taking on the title Bremont's Project Possible, and funding a large part of the second half of the project. Gasher Brum 1 and 2, summited on the 15th and 18th of July respectively, were arguably the most uneventful climbs of the project, as uneventful as 8,000 meter climbs can go, and brought NIMS up to 9 summits in 86 days. 
keep in mind that usually climbing just one of these mountains averages 56 days. For summit number 10, the team was headed to the second highest mountain in the world and my favorite to talk about, Chigori. On Chigori that year, nobody was making it to the summit. Teams kept having to turn back and I distinctly remember both the disappointment and relief I felt when several highly competent, experienced, and respected teams I was following announced that they were giving up their summit bid for the year, not seeing any way through. And then Nims showed up. Just like with most of the climbs thus far, he decided to split his team into rotations. He was going to make a total of six attempts to summit the mountain rotating in teams. If a group couldn't make it, Nims would return to base camp to let the climbers he was with rest, grab the next climbers, and head right up to try again. Despite intense planning, it only took them one attempt. Between himself, Lakpa Dendi Sherpa, Gesman Tamong, Changba Sherpa, and Lakpa Temba Sherpa, the team successfully fixed the route, and on July 24th, during one of the most intense climbing seasons in recent memory, his team was the first to summit Chigori, leading the way for the rest of the teams that year. As a side note, it was really interesting doing all the research for this video, because I kept reading in all of these articles about how the last major thing to happen for Chigori would be a winter ascent, because that's never happened before, and it's never gonna head to better. Is anyone ever gonna to try to take that it's done now nims did it this year it's done <laughs> oh and he did it without any supplemental oxygen this time because like f human physiology i guess i'm gonna be totally honest because it's not like i can get fired now the day that he was making the summit attempt of chigori i could not stay off of my phone at work i kept going to the bathroom to check for updates and when i saw that they finally had made it i almost felt like sick like a happy sick i was so excited i thought i was gonna throw up on the evening of july 25th the team returned to jagori's base camp and immediately headed to neighboring broad peak summiting on the morning of july 26th and marking the completion of phase two 11 mountains down in 94 days they climbed all five of pakistan's eight thousanders in just 23 days covering each base camp track on foot and carrying all their own kit because porters could not keep up with them the break between phase two and phase three was longer because they needed more rest and they needed to work a lot harder at fundraising for the next part of the project. In September, the team continued heading to Manaslu and successfully summiting on the 23rd. On September 27th, they summited their 13th mountain, Cho'oyu. But then, disaster struck. The last mountain that they needed to climb, Shishapangma, had been closed to all climbers for the season. Shockingly, there's not like a whole lot of news articles about this. I couldn't find a lot in reference to this, but I remember this time so distinctly because I remember when that news hit and he posted about that and I, like, it was devastating, y'all. I don't even have words for the devastation that I felt because it was like, this is over. Like, <laughs> it's over. There's... Everybody was prepared for like, if a, if a major event happened, if something awful happened, like you're prepared for that in mountaineering. We were prepared for all kinds of scenarios in which this project did not work, but to have this intense momentum and to feel like you're right there on the cusp of it. And then they close the mountain. I can't even imagine what Nims and his team was feeling because I was stressed. <laughs> there were only eight weeks left to make this project work and so many of us felt so desperate. Even though we'd only been witnessing it from our phone, we really felt like we were a part of this. Now, I don't remember if it was initiated by Nims or Bremont or the fans, but there was a modern day version of like a letter writing campaign on the team's behalf. People were emailing, writing, starting petitions, tagging officials on Twitter, getting big sponsorship companies like Red Bull involved. It was absolute madness. And if I remember correctly, even the government of Nepal stepped in and was like, uh, could we please get a few permits? Per just a few, just a few, please pretty please. And after a few weeks of negotiating, China issued permits just to Nims and his team so that they could complete the project. On October 29th, 2019, Nims and his team stood atop Shishipangma and proudly announced mission accomplished. In addition to now holding the fastest record for climbing all 14 8,000 meter mountains, Mingma David Sherpa became the youngest person to ever climb all 14 of them. Nims's original goal was accomplished in more ways than one. The full team of Nepalese climbers he worked with had the opportunity to break records and come into the world spotlight due to this project. I'm not gonna lie to y'all, I cried when that last summit happened and I was like tearing up while I was writing the script because I can still remember how profound this felt. This was such an incredibly, this was just so incredibly emotional. So even though this was a truly unprecedented feat, there was quite a bit of backlash in the climbing world. A lot of NIMS's critics simply don't like that he used supplemental oxygen. Some alpine purists believe that if you can't climb without it, you shouldn't be in the mountains. 
I haven't been in the mountains, and by all accounts, my opinion does not matter to climbers, but seriously, you think people should be risking brain damage and heart failure and all kinds of other things for the purity of climbing? No. No. Now, there's arguments to be made about bringing trash to the mountains and how ethical climbing is if you're not packing out all of your oxygen tanks and such, which is definitely a huge issue and something that we will talk about in the future, but that's not the argument that's being made here. Nims himself argues, and many agree, that it's plain irresponsible not to use supplemental oxygen when you're leading a team. Your decision-making at that point affects so many more people than just you, and impacted decision-making from lack of oxygen could lead to disaster. The 1996 Chomolungma disaster, which involved eight climbers being caught in a blizzard near the summit and dying, is speculated to have partially been caused by poor decision-making due to lack of proper oxygen in the death zone. I'll do an entire video on that soon because that's like that's a very complicated story. But the point is, you're responsible for more lives than your own, and you need to make sure you have every bit of your decision making ability, which means using supplemental oxygen. Nims also argues that he didn't use oxygen for the entire climbs, only camp four and above where he was in the death zone, which is beyond reasonable and safe. I personally think it's a ridiculous criticism to say that he can't claim this feat because he used oxygen. A lot of climbers use supplemental oxygen and their climbs are not so hotly contested. Same with a lot of the climbers who have climbed all 14 of the 8,000 meter mountains. Some of them have used supplemental oxygen and some of them has not, have not. And while there have always been arguments as to the validity of supplemental oxygen, why this has become such an argument on a massive scale with NIMS you could argue that it's because the story became so big or 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 it could just be racism now some people did criticize the veracity of his climb saying that if he was flying from base camp to base camp in nepal he couldn't truly claim these climbs since he was not doing the base camp treks and i do think that that's a fair assertion when climbing the 8,000 meter mountains most climbers do the base camp trek and it adds a significant amount of time to your climb and to my knowledge all of the other 14ers which are people who've climbed all 14 of the mountains have done the base camp treks. So when he went to Pakistan, he did everything on foot, running from base camp to base camp. And as I mentioned before, the total time for him to climb all five of the 8,000 meter pa peaks there was 23 days. So while I absolutely think it's fair to criticize his flying the to the base camps of the mountains in Nepal, I also think that he's proven that if he had chosen to, he easily could have set this record by actually doing the entire thing on foot. But I would have liked to have seen how much time it would have added to his record. I'm torn on how I feel about this because it does feel really shady to cheat. It feels like cheating. It does feel like cheating. I'll just, I'll just say it outright. When you are doing a record that is based on time and then you are making decisions that intentionally shave time off that other climbers don't have that option of doing, you're not really getting an accurate time and that's kind of shady. That's all I'm saying. Now, obviously I'm not saying he wouldn't have been able to do that. And I absolutely think that very few climbers still would have been able to do these climbs, especially running from base camp to base camp. I just would have been very interested to see what the total time ended up being. The whole timing of all of this is really interesting because I also think about all of the time that they lost, like they lost almost an entire month waiting for that permit to Shishapangma. And so the fact that it only took them six months and six days, even waiting for that permit is like, how much less time would it have taken if they didn't have to wait for that permit? But then when you take into account that they weren't doing the base camp treks, it's like maybe that kind of evens it out. Like maybe that full month was kind of like, you would have taken that time to do the base camp treks, you know? But yeah, the point of flying from base camp to base camp was to save time and probably energy. And again, that defeats the purpose a little bit, a little bit little bit. Some people argue whether this was real mountaineering because as I said before he was using supplemental oxygen but he also had a team to help him fix ropes and other things like he was climbing with a team and used the assets that come with climbing with a team and a lot of people argue that that makes it not real mountaineering but I'm gonna be real with y'all I don't see these criticisms when it comes to a lot of other climbers. A lot of other people's claims are not disputed when they're using teams or using fixed ropes or following already established routes. There have been others who've climbed all 14 of the 8,000ers with supplemental oxygen and other assets and have not gotten as much criticism. And there have been first ascents that were completed with supplemental oxygen that have not been as heatedly argued as not being true first ascents. I'm gonna be real with y'all. For a lot of old white climbers to be like, that's not real mountaineering just stinks of jealousy and racism to me. 
and a lot of other people agree, citing that it's mainly the old guard of mountaineering that's raising these concerns, and that it's just a new form of colonialism, and Westerners not being able to see literally anybody else succeed. One German mountaineer said it looks spectacular, but is not spectacular that he did this because he used supplemental oxygen. I'm sorry, you're so right. Physically climbing all these mountains, performing these rescues, doing all of the actual effort that this put in just doesn't count because he had a little tank of oxygen on his back. That totally took all of the effort out of it. We should just not at all be impressed by any of this because oxygen makes climbing mountains a cakewalk, right? I have seen valid criticisms of NIMS. I've seen valid criticisms of this climb, but... A lot of it comes down to people just arguing that it's not real mountaineering based on their own perceptions of mountaineering, and they don't raise the same criticisms with a lot of other people. Or if they do, they don't go at it as hard. Even Reinhold Messner, the first person to climb all 14 8,000ers, and who is notorious to be a stickler for not using supplemental oxygen or supporting the use of supplemental oxygen in the mountains, praised NIMS's climb, calling this a unique mountaineering achievement. Now, more criticism of NIMS comes from the fact that his teams helped fix lines and he was essentially using established routes, not new ones. For a specific set of climbers who call themselves alpinists, the thrill of climbing is in fast and light travel, carrying everything in a single push and not using fixed lines. Therefore, some argue that he shouldn't have used fixed lines or had such a large team or used established routes. But Nims has never claimed to be an alpinist. You don't get to put the rules of the type of alpinism you do on other mountaineers who never claimed to do that type of mountaineering. But again, Few people argue any of this when anyone else climbs the 8,000ers, whether it's a single mountain or all of them. Some sticklers will argue with any mountaineering that it's dead and almost nobody is a true mountaineer anymore, and some alpinists are just grumpy at everyone. But in general, people don't argue with other summiteers for using the exact same methods that Nims did. It doesn't detract from how incredible it is that he accomplished this in such a short amount of time while rescuing other climbers. A lot of people have pointed out that there is a lot of hypocrisy in this situation, but we need to call it what it is. Racism. Ultimately, a lot of people argue that Nims is not a real mountaineer because he used supplemental oxygen and he didn't make new routes. But he just ascended Chigori in the winter with no oxygen on a new route and successfully summited earlier this year, so I think all of his detractors can respectfully go eat a sock now. One valid criticism I do see came about a month after the completion of Project Possible. In November 2019, during a winter climb of Amadablam, Nims was guiding a team from Kuwait who wanted to hang a 330 by 100 foot Kuwaiti flag from the summit for a photo opportunity. This sparked outrage in the climbing community. Nims said that he was simply strengthening the relationship between Kuwait and Nepal and that it was all about positivity, but others argued that it was simply an inappropriate display of nationalism. Most argued that it wasn't up to Nims to make that decision, with the Nepalese Ministry of Tourism ultimately launching an investigation. Alexander Hillary, the great-grandson of infamous climber Sir Edmund Hillary, was on Amadablam at the time of the incident and not only accused Nims of rushing other climbers off of the summit for the photo op with the flag, but also that he left Sherpas to dismantle the flag, which weighed a total of 330 pounds and was carried in 55-pound pieces that were assembled at the summit without offering the team help. Many of the people who had praised Nims's dedication to his country and fellow Sherpas were appalled by this stunt that not only placed a foreign flag on the top of Amadablam that was larger than any Nepalese flag had ever flown, but also that he was willing to inconvenience and displace his fellow climbers and Sherpas, putting the Sherpas at even further risk because they were stuck in the death zone for longer and carrying heavier, lo heavier loads. While this wasn't a part of Project Possible itself, it happened literally the next month and is too important to leave out because that is a valid criticism and is something that a lot of people have kept their eye on with his continuing projects is, is this self-serving? What's kind of going to happen here? Overall, the world stays a bit divided on Nims Dai. While the majority agree that he's an incredible mountaineer capable of superhuman feats, many also question his true motives and whether he promotes the true spirit of mountaineering. I myself stay torn at times. While I admire and respect a lot of what he's done, I also question some of his decisions and don't put him on a pedestal. 
I'll be interested to see what he continues to do in the future, and while I'll always be very interested at new project announcements, I'm also going to hold space for the knowledge that he's already seriously misstepped, and we don't ever really know what he's going to do next. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like and a comment. I'm very curious about your opinions. I want to know what you think of Nimza's accomplishments, and I also want to know if you think it's fair to give him this record, knowing that he used helicopters to get to some of the base camps. If you're new here, we do these mountain talk videos nearly every week, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next one. A huge thank you to all of my patrons for your support on my Patreon and helping me with this content creation. If you would like to support me, my Patreon and my Instagram are both linked down below. With Patreon, I currently just have a tip tier for the content that I'm already creating, but I'm actively working on some content that I'll be releasing soon, and I have some really exciting announcements coming up, so stay tuned for that. I, I, I still don't have an outro, so go drink some water!